Five Live Formula One. Hello and welcome to Monaco. It is the round eight of the Formula One World Championship and we find ourselves in the wonderful Monte Carlo where the weather is, well, I would say it's lovely, but it's not actually. It's quite cloudy now and there's all eyes looking over to the right side of me, which is over the cliffs of Italy where weather is threatening to once again disrupt. It didn't earlier, although there was a smattering of rain, but they're all looking that way to see what will the next hour bring. One hour of practice left today and even though the boats are out there bobbing along on the the harbour and all the celebrities and fancy people that come to Monaco are still here, it wasn't all plain sailing earlier on for Max Verstappen. He ended up 12th fastest in FP1, but the fastest of all was Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes. We haven't said that for a long time, and I'm standing right in front of his silver car, waiting to go out there, um, all ready to send him out. And I have to say, Harry Benjamin, our lead commentator, I don't think anyone was expecting that. No, uh, it was great to see you as well. George Russell was up there too in third, but uh, it was tight at the top. The the top five at the end of FP1, Hamilton, Piastri, Russell, Norris and Leclerc separated by less than three tenths of a second. Interesting things to note though, obviously Mercedes, perhaps they have found a little something, but not everybody ran the soft compound of tyre in FP1, particularly focusing on Ferrari. They looked blisteringly quick on the medium and the hard, which they did run, but the fact they were so quick and didn't run the soft, that could be very pivotal for where Ferrari stack up come the rest of this weekend. Looking forward to finding out more in FP2. I was speaking to Sir Jackie Stewart on the way over to the pit lane today, and even he was quite excited. It was, that's Lewis Hamilton going out. They're already getting out towards the end of the pit lane. They want to be first out and get as much running as they can. Um, he was excited about the prospect of maybe six people challenging for um, for pole position this weekend. So as Max Verstappen takes the track as well. Um, Tell me more about this, Mark Priestley. Sorry, I almost got run over by the uh, car of Max Verstappen. That's why I was just shuffling out the way. It's easy to do here, isn't it, Mark? It is. Yeah, that's one of the challenges of Monaco. From a, a driving perspective, it's tight and twisty. You've got to thread your way through millimetres away from the barriers, and that is the key to the fastest lap time. It's as close as you dare to get. Having confidence to bury the throttle as soon as you come out of corners and keeping it really, really tight. So that's how you get a quick lap round here. The way you build up to that is by getting lap time, is by getting track time rather. So the more and more laps you're able to put in, gradually building towards that really close run through the, the streets here, that's how you build the lap times where it needs to be when it really matters, of course, tomorrow in qualifying. Because as we know, qualifying can be everything around the Grand Prix weekend here in Monaco. Yeah, Andrew Benson is also in the commentary box. And Andrew, um, what are you writing about at the moment? What's happened between the two practice sessions? Anything of interest? Uh, no, there was a very, That's very, <laughs> there was a very, very boring press conference. Um, I've, I've heard lots of interesting things today that I can't tell you about, unfortunately. Oh, come yet. on now, that's not fair. No, I can't. I'm sorry, but um, I think it's, we are all like, very interested to see what this session shows us because this is the one where we find out, Jenny, isn't it? Where um, not only the one lap pace for qualifying, which is the most important thing, but also, although it is mostly about qualifying in Monaco, it's not all about qualifying. You do have to have race pace as well. We'll get to see that a little bit later on as well. I mean, it's worth saying, when we talk about how important qualifying is, people have only really won this race from the top at three for the last almost 30 years. So it is key to be in that top three and we, let's see at the end of this session exactly what happens. I will hand over to the safety of the uh, commentary box as I meander through the pit lane and try and bring you anything else that's happening and anything that's exciting. But over to you, Harry Benjamin. Thank you very much. Yeah, from 69 races held in Monaco, 31 of them have been won from pole position. 47 have been won from the front row. The furthest back came uh, in the form of uh, the one win wonder of Olivier Panis back in 1996. He started down in 14. Well, it was a bit of a, a hectic race, but we're a little bit away from race day. First, we've got to finish off Friday 
And that will conclude with this final hour of running in free practice two. Uh, let's just bring you up to speed then with how the constructors in the Drivers' Championship lies. It's Max Verstappen, who currently leads the way with 161 points to his name. He is 48 clear of Charles Leclerc, who is now in second. Sergio Perez, after a tough Imola, has fallen down to third in the championship ahead of Norris and Sainz. That's the top five. And then over in the Constructors' Championship, it is, of course, Red Bull, who lead with 268 points. They are 56 clear of Ferrari, who are a further 58 clear of McLaren. Then it's Mercedes and Aston Martin with the lower half of the table headed up by RB in sixth. Pass behind them. Alpine with just one point to their name managed to pit Williams and Sauber ninth and tenth yet to get off the mark in the constructors. That is the lay of the land as we head into the eighth round of this, the longest season in Formula One. And for those who wish to do a sync up for FP2, it's coming at you right now. 59 minutes and 12, 11, 10 seconds remain as Lewis Hamilton makes his way through the hairpin, that left-hander where you really have to... It's the only corner, I think, in the entire calendar, Mark, where you're turning the steering wheel full lock, full left, almost 360. Not quite, but almost. That's right. And, and you know, you, if, you, if you approach it wrong, if you don't get the entry right, there is the possibility that you can't make it round because you're on full lock, but you need all of that full lock, but you also need the right line. So when people get out of, out of shape or out of position into that corner, it can be a challenge. And I said this earlier on today, but when I worked for McLaren back in the day, we actually used to bring bespoke steering racks, bespoke suspension that would allow a little bit of extra lock just to give the drivers a few more options when it comes to that very, very tight corner. Well, Lewis Hamilton makes his way on his first flyer up through Sandoval. It's actually a really steep incline. The television pictures don't do it justice when you see it in person. Making your way through the right-hander, uphill, through Beau Rivage, then Massenet, Casino Square beckons as you head left, then right. Then it's downhill into the breaking of Mirabeau. We've seen a couple of cars head off there into the runoff area previously. Then you get to the left-hander of the hairpin. Really slow speed corner, slowest on the circuit before you wind your way around the tight, twisty streets that make up the Monaco Grand Prix circuit into the tunnel. Now, it's not raining massively. It was only uh, spitting a little earlier on. But of course, if it does get heavier, particularly we're expecting there to be quite a lot of rain during qualifying. It's a really interesting scenario dealing with that tunnel, isn't it? Because that stays dry initially. That's right. So you've got the challenge of going from a, a wet to dry track and then back again. You've also got the challenge of the sort of light levels changing. So, you know, your iris has to very rapidly adjust for that. You've got the, the sort of challenge of, of water on your visor if indeed it, it is raining. So, yeah, there's a few unique qualities around Monaco. Those are one of them. Obviously, the fact that any mistake is punished around here very heavily. Um, because of the fact the walls are so close, but also the fact that you need to run so close to those walls to, to get the lap time, as we said earlier on. We've got a brilliant position for our commentary box, which is right at the top of the grandstand that overlooks the exit of the swimming pool chicane. Uh, and then right opposite us, we can see the pit lane. We're just opposite McLaren and Ferrari. So you get a lovely view of pit lane. Quite a unique setup here because it is so tight. It is so small. There actually isn't a pit wall where you normally expect the engineers to be sat overlooking the main straight. Instead, they are all in, well, encased in, in a building that's now three floors. Garage, then you have the second floor with the engineers. And then you have now a third floor where they've added hospitality. And we get a little bit of traffic building up into the final quarter. Charles Leclerc trying to thread his way through and build a gap. And just talking about that, that pit wall or sort of lack of it as we normally expect it, there is on the other side of the pits, uh, uh, the, the main straight, and there are there is a sort of pit wall, which is where they hang out the pit board for the drivers to come past every time. That's another challenge around this place because the lap time is so short, such a short circuit. We're talking about lap times of just over a, a minute and 15 seconds, 14 seconds. You're, you, you don't get very long to reposition all the numbers on your pit board and hang it back out again before your driver turns up. So there's lots of unique things about this place, but that's another one of them. Yeah, first lap time is coming on the board. Lewis Hamilton with a 114.0 on the medium tyre. Half a second clear of Magnussen. Verstappen is out there on the hard tyre, just making his way out the exit of the tunnel now. We'll see what his first flyer delivers on the hard. Somebody who didn't get much running, if any, in FP1 was Pierre Gasly in the Alpine. Jenny, have you got more for us? 
Yeah, well, he has managed to get out straight away. They just did a couple of laps at the end of FP1, but it's certainly going to be a challenge for Gasly to actually get this together because, as you know, it takes you a while for you to dial that car in, and he hasn't had that first running in FP1. But I'm sure he'll get up to speed as quickly as possible. But he will be kind of on the back foot now. Um, and just a note after FP1, it was a costly session for Valtteri Bottas. He was caught speeding in the pit lane, and they issue um, a hundred euro fine for each kilometre you're going faster than the speed limit which is 60 kilometres an hour so he picked up the maximum £1,000 fine for going at 74.6 kilometres in the pit lane naughty boy oh I'm sure he'll uh, he'll do another advert and that'll be fine for him <laughs> just to interrupt you there Jenny Sergio Perez doing well almost what Logan Sargent did in FP1 as well coming into the left hander of Massonet which then delivers you through Casino Square Mark he clattered the wall on the inside yeah and it was it was a glancing blow it didn't sort of stop him you know in his tracks but it's reasonably heavy I mean I have to say when you look at the slow-mo replay of that he did give it a decent clout. Uh, nothing fell off, and he continues, but I'm sure the team will want to have a closer look at it. Uh, forgive if you just heard an exhaling a breath from me as well. We just saw another replay of the McLaren coming out of the exit of the swimming ball chicane, all crossed up and nearly finding the wall. So pushing hard, trying to find that little bit of extra grip. Uh, just coming back to what Jenny was saying about Pierre Gasly as well. I mean, losing out on track time, yes, Thankfully, this week is just a normal traditional weekend. It's not a sprint weekend, so we get FP2, we get FP3. But how important is it, not just for the driver, but for the team as well, Mark, to build up that momentum lap by lap, session by session, as Leclerc goes fastest, a 113.4 on the medium tyre? Yeah, it's really important. In fact, it's everything around here. You know, you, you can, of course, in, and the teams will be wanting to make changes to the car as they go through tweaking things like setup, but actually, the driver needs to get that lap, that uh, consistency of laps in. And, and with him missing most of that first session, he hasn't been able to do that yet. Everyone else is building on what they learned this morning. Pierre Gasly is, is kind of starting afresh. So he will be on the back foot. The team will need to do the same things. Everything's a little bit different here about how you operate, how you operate the car. And all of that learning has to be put into practice. It's always about making tiny little tweaks and, and iterations to the way that you're set up, the way you drive the car, the way you engineer it. There's no massive sweeping changes in Monaco because you don't want to upset what the driver has become used to as the weekend progresses. So rarely ever do you get a massive change, but it's all about making the small ones. And for that, you need time on track. Three-time winner around here, Lewis Hamilton, has just gone to the top of the times, a 113.3. Then it's Leclerc, less than a tenth back. Verstappen now in third. Fernando Alonso has just slotted up into fourth ahead of the Daniel Ricciardo RB car. Verstappen coming towards the end of another quick lap where he is up on time. Logan Sargent is saying on the radio, we're hearing that he has hit the wall. He hit the wall in FP1 as well, got away with it. Uh, no yellow flags out on track, so we can presume he's managed to carry on going. We haven't seen how it happened as Verstappen on the hard tyre goes to the top. A 1.13.2, less than half a tenth. Uh, Andrew... What's your initial readings on this? Because this track, I suppose, doesn't expose weaknesses in cars as much as other circuits. So is that what's playing into the likes of Mercedes' hands right now? And we haven't yet seen what Ferrari have got on that soft tyre too. They look quick in FP1. They're showing pace again already. So my initial reaction is, uh-oh, Verstappen looks fast again. <laughs> uh, he's on the hard tyre and he's quicker than everybody else at the moment. Not by much, but there's quite a big offset between this, those two tyre compounds, about half a second, six tenths of a second normally. So that effectively means, assuming the cars are fueled to a relatively similar level, which they probably are, and certainly Red Bull seem to err on the sort of heavy side of fuel on Fridays, to be quickest of all, although we're seeing Charles Leclerc coming round on his uh, medium tyres, and he looks like he's about to go top of the timesheets in just a few seconds' time. Um, and here he goes across the line, he's eight tenths, so actually that's more encouraging for Ferrari, actually nearly nine tenths for Leclerc. So that's more like the competitive picture we saw this morning, Harry, with, with the Ferrari, the quickest car. Uh, but Red Bull seem to have got on top of their um, car earlier this morning, uh, or rather earlier this afternoon, I should say. That's my age showing, because the first session used to be in the morning, Mark, didn't it? <laughs> it did. um, the uh, Red Bull was bouncing and loose over the bumps, he was saying. Uh, more radio messages we're hearing. Yuki Sonoda hit the wall. That's what he's reported. And we're just seeing 
Logan Sargent's excursion with the wall. It looked like a light touch, Mark, coming through Anthony Noves. Yeah, that's exactly the final corner. It just got a little bit uh, over the bump on the uh, the apex, which threw him out wide, and uh, he wasn't able to correct it quickly enough. So he's kissed the wall with the right, uh, left front tyre. I don't think it's going to cause damage. I think he'll be OK, but he did do it this morning. And, and you know, there's this very, very fine line I've often been in the garage when the cars come back and the driver doesn't even realise they've hit the wall, yet the tyre's all scuffed, you know, and all the, the sort of Pirelli markings are gone. And you, you ask the driver, did you hit the wall? He says, no. I said, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that's how close they have to run. So um, it's a very, very fine margin. And one of the things that's great about Monaco is that you really get to see in such vivid detail the precision of Formula One drivers. We've been seeing yeah. a couple of replays of the uh, second uh, chicane at the swimming pool and that's probably the best place to see that because on the inside of that apex they have to basically the apex is the barrier so they if you're getting it right what you're doing is you're skimming the barrier with your inside front wheel now that's hard enough to do just not sliding but but what people may not realize is that the Formula one cars are sliding all the time even though you don't it doesn't look like it from the telly they're balancing it on the edge of adhesion. So they're judging the turning point with the car sliding, usually maybe understeering, maybe oversteering a little bit, but they've got it. So they have to kiss that barrier. Sometimes they kiss the barrier so much that the barrier actually deforms a little bit as the car goes past it or touches it. And if you get that absolutely right, that's the quickest lap time. If you get it a millimeter wrong too much on the to going inside the corner too much, then you've broken your front suspension and crashed into the outside wall on the exit. And Monaco allows us to see that over and over again through the weekend. It's really beautiful. So easy to make the smallest of mistakes, Jenny, isn't it? And uh, be punished for them where at other tracks you probably get away with it. Absolutely. I'm standing opposite from where you are, so I have that view of the swimming pool chicane and the crane that just hangs over the top of it in case someone has a little oops and goes too close. But think about Max Verstappen last year, wasn't it here that he kissed the barrier about three times and had the perfect lap? You get the perfect lap time. You know, as Andrew said, you sort of have to make contact. You just hope it's it's light contact. So, um, yeah, the, the very best drivers are the ones that are able to do that over and over again over the course of all of the laps of a Grand Prix, or of course when it really matters under massive pressure on Saturday afternoon. You've got to be that close, but you just don't want to be, you know, over the top of the mark. Forty-seven minutes, thirty-seven. 36, 35 seconds remain of free practice too. Charles Leclerc is fastest on the medium tyre, seven tenths clear of Lewis Hamilton. Then it's Norris, Verstappen, Sainz rounding out the top five. Russell, Sonoda, Stroll, Bottas, Piastri, who's on a decent lap at the moment on the hard tyre, currently rounds out the top ten. Then it's the two houses of Hulkenberg and Magnussen. Alonso Perez down in 14th at the moment in front of Esteban Ocon. And it's Albon, Ricardo, Gasly, Sargent, who came back into the pits to have a check on the damage he had done to the Williams, if any. Uh, after he scraped the barrier coming out of the final corner, he's now out onto the track in 19th. And Joe Guanyu, 20th and last, he also had a skirmish with the barrier. Fairly hefty whack into the barrier at the exit of saint Devot, coming into the right-hander in Turn 1 in free practice one. So much so that a bit of his front plate broke off and was collected on the underside of the Ferrari of Charles Leclerc. Both of them made it back. That brought out a brief red flag before we got going again. But those two, Sergeant and Joe, under pressure for their seats, perhaps feeling the pressure slightly so far this weekend in Monaco. And it's an interesting time, Mark, isn't it? Because the driver market is in a really fluid situation right now. All, of course, kick-started by Lewis Hamilton's early signing with Ferrari and the announcement of it for 2025 onwards. Russell on the radio. Guys, this vibration break in turn 11 is getting insane at the moment. So fan hold onto a steering wheel. Yeah, copy that. We're looking into the data. See, that's the kind of thing that upsets the driver. He's got that in his head now. And, you know, you can't be thinking about anything other than being utterly focused about threading this car through these streets. So if you've got uh, something that's unusual, I heard earlier um, one of the drivers, uh, was it Magnussen, talking about his seat was, was slightly uncomfortable, slightly unusual. You just don't want any of those thoughts creeping in. Uh, George Russell talking about a vibration from the brakes. Yes, they'll be able to correct it, they'll be able to fix it, maybe a change of brakes at the end of the session, but it's just one extra thing to focus on that the driver doesn't need. 
coming back to the driver market, you're right, it's, it's in a state of flux, and that's, I think, brilliant. We don't know where the, the pieces are all going to land. We've got some of the major players have already locked themselves in, as you said, starting with Lewis, but we still don't really know if Max Verstappen has got a long-term future at Red Bull. You might think that sounds crazy with a car that's been so dominant, but things are changing. There's a massive set of regulation changes coming on the horizon in 26, and people are having to start to think about that. Um, I can say that it's almost certain Verstappen will stay at Red Bull next year unless something really crazy happens at Red Bull. Um, I've been hearing that this weekend from some pretty good sources. Um, I think for 2026, though, it's a uh, it's much more open question. Um, but uh, that's obviously some way away. It's, it's more of the teams, other than it's more of the teams at the sort of second end of the grid now. And the sort of and also, and it looks also right, by the way, Red Bull will probably keep Sergio Perez because there's not really a lot of uh, options that they find particularly more appealing. Um, again, my, largely because uh, most of the top drivers are under contract. Charles Leclerc, meanwhile, by the way, has been um, slowly decreasing his lap time and is now uh, still more than eight tenths clear of the field, although Oscar Piastri on the hard tyre has just popped up into second place ahead of Lewis Hamilton. I just wanted to tell you a little anecdote that I heard earlier. Here's Verstappen's radio. I'm jumping like a kangaroo, man. I'm getting headaches. It's crazy. Verstappen not happy in his Red Bull. A lot of bouncing going on. That was the uh, complaint in FP1. So the bumps around here not reacting well, well with Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. Just before you jump in with your anecdote, uh, Andrew, that, that is a symptom of the modern era of Formula 1 where you have to run the car very, very stiff to get it to work aerodynamically with the underside. You need to maintain that level platform. Yet we're on the streets of Monaco, which are insanely bumpy. So the engineers don't want to compromise the sort of overall aerodynamic stiffness, but the driver's getting, you know, suffering the effects of that as it clatters over curbs and lumps and bumps. I want it, a Benson anecdote. Yeah, so it was really, it's really an illustrative of how under pressure Red Bull is starting to feel uh, at the front of the field. I heard today that uh, on the grid at Imola last weekend, Paul Monaghan, the Red Bull chief engineer, was standing over the McLaren front wing, pointing at it and moaning at an FIA representative about various things he didn't like about the front end of the <laughs> McLaren car, which from Red Bull is surefire indication that they're thinking, this car's getting a little bit too close for comfort, and what can we do to slow it down? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, at the moment, I think Red Bull should be looking a little closely at Ferrari as well. Charles Leclerc is currently fastest a 112 one on the medium and he is continuing to put in fast lap times ahead four tenths ahead of lewis hamilton in the mercedes max verstappen in the red bull is a further tenth behind in third piastri is also raging in that uh, mclaren really yeah. looks on edge every time we cut to a, a picture of piastri's fourth signs in fifth I think what's uh, interesting and certainly looking good if you're a Ferrari fan is that Ferrari looked quick on both tyres. They were very fast on the hard tyre uh, earlier on. And now on the medium tyre, also looking incredibly quick. Max Verstappen at this point, and I know we're early on, there's still a long way to go, but Max Verstappen hasn't been able to find an answer for the pace that Charles Leclerc has got in that Ferrari. So this could still play out. It's be really, be, be really interesting as the weekend unfolds. It's also worth saying that Ferrari are always quick in Monaco, it seems. Last year, yeah. they were really weak, generally, but Leclerc still put it third on the grid, uh, if, I rem if I remembered that correctly, certainly on the second row. He was on pole in 2022. OK, in 2022, at the start of the year, they probably had the fastest car, but he was even on pole here in 2021, when he very much didn't have the fastest car. So that was an extraordinary lap. He also did that in Baku, by the way, the same year. Don't know how he did that. Some kind of miracle he pulled off there. But uh, it just goes to show Ferrari being... Look, you know, they've been improving this year. They've been the second fastest team on balance through the start of the season, even if McLaren came on strong after their upgrade in Miami. So it's, I don't know what it is about the Ferrari car, but it's always gone, it's traditionally always gone well around here at Monaco. And it does rather look like it at the moment. I mean, just to give you people a rundown of the times as the drivers start to pull into the pits and get ready for the qualifying simulation runs, Leclerc is nine tenths quicker than Lewis Hamilton in second place, both on the medium tyre and 1.1 seconds quicker than Max Verstappen in the Red Bull, who's third on the hard tyre. So even for allowing for the tyre offset on the Red Bull, Leclerc is substantially quicker than both Hamilton and Verstappen. It is just practice, but the early signs are looking rather nice for Charles Leclerc and Ferrari. That was uh, the voice of the BBC F1 correspondent, Andrew Benson, alongside myself, Harry Benjamin, is the former McLaren mechanic, Mark Priestley. And down in the pit lane is Jenny Gow. Thank you, AS, and the cars are just being wheeled back in front of me, Lance Stroll, 
in the green Aston Martin just getting pushed back into the garage. You can hear that sound of the horn. That just makes everyone aware that a car is coming into the pit lane, which is very narrow. Um, I'm separated by a barrier from where their cars are. They must be like half a meter away from me. And they're charging down at 60 kilometers an hour when they pull into their pit stop um, place. And it's, they're double stacking them as they come in a lot of the time here at Monaco. And it's so tight they have to get on their marks absolutely precisely but i've seen a, a couple of drivers not getting their marks not hitting them and it's the ones who are slightly newer to f1 and it does make a big difference to the pit crew they want to they want to welcome you in exactly where the marked out places are so the wheel gun can connect with the wheel nut quickly and they can make that change as quickly as possible because Pit stops here are essential for trying to make an undercut or an overcut on your, component, uh, on, your, on your opponents because we all know passing here is very, very difficult. So it's nice to see them all doing that practice as they come in, just taking their time to make sure all the processes are done before they wheel them back in and uh, they do a little quick debrief before they go out again and do those fast runs that I'm looking forward to. One of the things, Jenny, about pit stops here and one of the reasons that we're seeing all this practice happen in front of you is that because the garages are so tightly packed together, there isn't space between each of the teams like you'd get at many of the circuits, which gives you a lot more of a sort of lead into your pit box. So when you swing into your marked out zone, your pit box in front of the garage, you're actually ending up in that pit box while still turning the car into your final position. It's actually a really tricky manoeuvre. And then imagine that in a race situation when there's a whole crowd of your crew that are around there, maybe the team next door are coming out at the same time. It's actually a real challenge and something that's very different here to other tracks. So they do have to practice it, and you're right, they do have to get it right on Sunday. 2021, Battery Bottas, Mercedes, and the longest pit stop yeah. ever. <laughs> Over 43 hours, I think it was. You know, as Watching that, Mark, as a mechanic, that must have been excruciating. Oh, it's horrible. You know, whenever you see a pit stop go wrong, and we've seen a few earlier on in the season this season, you know, earlier this year, it's a horrible experience for me to watch it because it always looks like a sort of calamitous, almost comedy affair. You can imagine a bit of comedy music set to it and it'd be a hilarious little meme. I'm sure there have been some, but it's, it's rarely ever just down to a, a kind of individual or not often even a human error. It might be that there's a component failed or a piece of technology that's let somebody down. But as a member of that crew, you always feel like you look like a complete idiot when it's going wrong. And it's a very harsh situation. That's the sort of pressure that these guys are working on and uh, of course in the in the most part we see absolute excellence up and down the pit lane that was a unique experience wasn't it for mercedes and battery bosses they couldn't get the front right wheel off and couldn't get it off until they got the car back to the factory <laughs> a, a bizarre experience but all right it just shows how i think we've become so used to pit stops in formula one pretty much being seamless you know if it's yeah. not if it's not under two seconds or around the two second mark it's slow yeah and when it does go wrong, that's massive. And particularly in a place like this, it can cost you position on the track too. Yeah. Uh, a couple of cars out on track at the moment. Albon, Sargent in the Williams, Perez out on track, Joe Guanyu, and I think Jenny, Max Verstappen emerging. Yep, he's just gone out on track, a shiny new set of red banded tyres on his car. And interestingly, Adrian Newey is at the back of the um, garage at Red Bull. He's in his normal clothes, not in any kind of uniform and looking very uh, casual, I suppose, with his little notebook attached to his arm once again. Very interesting. Well, Jenny, on that point, just to remind everybody, Adrian Newey uh, has, uh, is leaving Red Bull. Um, he was in Miami uh, a couple of races ago uh, working, but Christian Horner said after that race that uh, the races that Newey came to from now on would mainly be ones where they're trying to sell their RB17 road car, which he designed. Um, so he's pretty much out of the loop there, which is not surprising given he negotiated an early exit from his contract and he's going to be free to join another team and he will join another team in the early part of next year. And what are we thinking, Andrew? Is it Ferrari? Um, so I, re I believe that a couple of the newspapers have basically said it's going to be Ferrari. They don't know that because Adrian Newey doesn't know that yet. I'm told from sources close to Newey, uh, who I won't reveal the identity of, them, obviously. Um, basically, he's only going to go to a top team. Um, I'm not going to say for sure, but um, it won't be Mercedes because they're not chasing him. It won't be Red Bull because he's just left them. So it's either going to be Ferrari or McLaren. 
What I find interesting is uh, the culture at Ferrari now. Fred Vasseur being in charge, a, a team principal. I think he's really invoked a bit of a culture change at that team. It now seems like a place where people are empowered rather than, you know, repressed is probably a strong word. But you talk to anybody at Ferrari and they're full of hope and optimism. Lewis Hamilton's coming to the team. They feel like it feels like they're in a really good place. And I'm sure that is probably a big tick box for somebody like Adrian Newey when he's assessing what team will he go to next. Absolutely. And it, it counts a huge amount for everybody who works there, that change of environment. You know, I do a lot of sort of corporate speaking in, in another part of my life. And I actually, for the last few years, have always used the Ferrari example as the example of how not to do it because their culture has been so difficult to work in and, and restrictive and almost a, a sort of blame type culture they're under massive pressure of course by the Italian nation really particularly the Italian press but it is changing you're right it's no longer being led by an Italian maybe that makes a difference under Fred Vasseur but he's a calm relaxed guy he's an out and out racer and I think that's what the team needs and he does feel like he's putting the right elements in place for the future just something really interesting. Max Verstappen has just completed his first lap on the soft tyre and he's not even beaten yeah. the time that Charles Leclerc did on the medium tyre earlier and Leclerc's about to come to the end of his lap. Harry, talk us through it. He certainly is. He's approaching the uh, braking zone of Raskas through the right hand, the fastest of anybody in the first sector, fastest of anybody in the middle sector, having stuck on the softest compound tyre. Verstappen, two and a half tenths back. Perez, a second back as Leclerc finds three tenths of a second on his own lap time he puts in a one minute 11 278 to go half a second clear of max verstappen that is a ferrari and a red bull both running the same tire but the red bull is half a second slower than the ferrari so on adrian newey just to finish that point off i think so th there's a romantic appeal to ferrari uh, and it's also something he hasn't done he's won championships with his paris's radio the, the ride is horrendous I cannot see a fix of three from the front. So that's Perez effectively making the same point as Verstappen did earlier, that the car is bouncing around and jumping with its stiff suspension. They're obviously trying to set the car at a particular ride height that works best for them, but it's uh, having a, a detrimental effect on the, on the ride for the drivers. So there's a romantic appeal to Ferrari. He's won at Williams, he's won at McLaren. There is Adrian Newey on the telly, by the way, and as Jenny says, in a nice fetching orange cap. I'm not sure orange is Adrian's colour. Um, is it a sign of where he's going? <laughs> yeah, very papaya-esque, that cat. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, he, but, and he's won at Williams, McLaren and, Ferra and uh, Red Bull. Ferrari is the last one. And also, it, he's already a legend. But imagine how much more of a legend he would become if he could turn Ferrari into world champions with Lewis Hamilton as well. He'd have the keys to Italy, wouldn't he? He would have the keys to Italy. But it's a disruptive move. And it'd be one where he's not as confident of making as, as a as confident, excuse me, of making as an initial impact as large as he might be at a team where he's more familiar with the environment. So, for example, there's a, there's a big language barrier there at Ferrari. Not with Fred Vasseur, not with Lewis Hamilton, not with Charles Leclerc, but not all the engineers will speak perfect English. And he'll have to take him time to settle in in a way that it probably wouldn't at McLaren, which is an environment he's familiar with. And I think we shouldn't underestimate that he's actually really close friends with Zach Brown the McLaren Racing Chief Executive Officer. So I think McLaren is a real possibility, um, although obviously Ferrari would be the one that has a more visceral appeal for Newey. On the driver front, just quickly, what if Hamilton can't beat Leclerc next year? That dynamic, Mark, could that be, could that undo all the great work that is going on at Ferrari right now within this culture? Well, look, I mean, Ferrari have got two great drivers right now, and this has been a, a sort of ongoing question from Formula One fans, particularly early in the season, as Science was, was the, the kind of lead of the two, really, or certainly the one doing the best in the early races. Um, so you can always look at it and say, why change something that's already working quite well? But Lewis Hamilton is Lewis Hamilton. He comes with a massive amount of marketing potential. He's a seven-time world champion. He's got an absolute wealth of experience, and that counts for a lot. And especially when you're going through a big period of change. To have a team leader or someone who comes with such stature into your organization, it can be quite inspiring. It can really inspire, you know, everybody within that organization. And that could be a really great place. That's this culture change that we're talking about. Lewis Hamilton could be, could be part of that. Uh, 30 minutes and 40 seconds remain of free practice too. Very much getting into uh, one lap qualifying simulations. 
majority out on track on that soft compound tyre. Leclerc fastest, four tenths ahead of Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin, who's just gone up into second. Verstappen still out there making his way through the hairpin now, half a second back. Norris just came across the line, oh, the could ball. only manage oh, fourth, and that was a tap on the wall, yeah. and he slowed right down. That's just coming into the right-hander that brings you towards the tunnel. He's still carrying round, but that was a hit. It's for the wall for Max Verstappen. Yeah, left rear tyre, it's coming through Portier, got a little snap of oversteer, and uh, the right rear definitely looked like it clattered the wall. This, maybe we'll hear from him shortly, but he's, he's winding his way slowly back through the swimming pool section. Uh, and he'll find his way. We'll see if he pulls into the pits, but I think the team are going to certainly need to take a, a little close look at that. They certainly will. He's uh, slowed right off the pace. Let's hear what he had to say. I f older. Well, he did hit the wall. He's right about that as he peels into the pits and uh, the Red Bull team will check that damage. Just getting another look at it now. So it makes his way through the hairpin, coming round through Portier and the rear just gets a little loose and uh, even coming into the second bit of the right hander and it was a, 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 fla a flat on hit though with well, the rear left. Yeah but you know that's exactly what we've heard him and Perez talking about. The car seems too stiff, the ride's really uncomfortable and he bounced over the apex curve, it, curve, it really unsettled the car and spat him into the outside wall so they might need to start looking at how whether they soften up this car a little bit, give it a bit more compliance so he can ride those curves a little better. We're getting so many radio messages through from various drivers. Piastri, Sonoda's just said on the radio, I've hit the wall. So all of them pushing hard out there. It's uh, green flag conditions, so no one has uh, gone in too hard as Piastri, having just said he hit the wall, comes across the line on the medium tyre. And he manages ninth, a second off uh, Leclerc's soft tyre run. His teammate, uh, Lando Norris, on his soft tyre run was down in fourth fastest we're just seeing another look at Yuki Tsunoda making his way up through Sandoval gets oh so close to the wall was that content yeah that's the one he was talking about yeah, it, it was, was just a kiss I think that one's perfectly okay as a, as a sort of engineer I'd be all right with that um, with Verstappen's I'd be a lot more concerned yeah he has come back to the pits now has Max Verstappen but the majority of cars out there on track with the exception of Verstappen and Logan Sargent and Joe Guan Yu. Everybody else out there on the track on either the soft compound or the medium compound tyre. But this is looking good then for Charles Leclerc and the Ferrari. But that was also an excellent lap too from Fernando Alonso and the Aston Martin to get closer than the Red Bull and the McLaren on these first runs on the soft. I just want to put a bit of a pause on that. I think Leclerc does look outstandingly fast. I'll be but getting too carried away. I think we are. I can't believe that a Red Bull and a McLaren are half a second or more slower than a Ferrari. It just doesn't make sense. So I think we, we, we've got to remember it's Friday practice. They're not necessarily all running the same fuel loads. They're not all necessarily running the same engine modes. So while I do think Ferrari look really strong, I think it would be really wrong and premature to be ruling out Red Bull and McLaren at this point. Oh, there's the voice of reason, Andrew Benson. I mean, let us get excited, Andrew. Come on. <laughs> but I do agree. It is early in the weekend and a lot can still change. Um, but I, I do think what we're, we're clearly seeing is a Verstappen, you know, I know we saw this last race as well, a Verstappen who's not happy. So forget the lap times and whatever we're seeing on track at the moment. He's, he's not happy. The radio messages are not happy. His teammates echoing his comments. So they haven't got the car in, a, in the sweet spot yet. And so they will have work to do, but... We've seen this before, haven't we? When it comes to Saturday, and particularly Saturday afternoon, that sweet spot is exactly where they often find themselves. This is out of Charles Leclerc, having a little bit of a lock-up coming into the hairpin. Made to turn in to the left-hander, then had to bail out of it, got oh so close to the wall, and then still managed to make the turn. Well, but a little bit of a hairy moment for Charles Leclerc. Now going again, next lap around. Fastest, he's up on himself in sector one, and coming through Portier. The rear end stepping out, he has to get off the throttle. That would have cost him time as he comes yeah, through the tunnel. It's understeer that he suffered with actually, and understeer under at the hairpin first, and then understeer through Portier, which then flipped himself into a, a little bit of oversteer. So that car definitely not quite got the front end bite that he requires to get through those tight and twisty bits. Yeah, I think he's probably got the best out of those tyres, Mark. Now hasn't he? He's had uh, he's done quite. A, he's, that was his seventh lap on those tyres. So yeah. I think he's what he's learned from those couple of moments at, the, at, the, at Lowe's, as I insist on calling it, and Portier is that the tyres probably aren't going as long as he wanted them to go in that run. Yeah. 
bit of traffic as well in the form of the Aston Martin getting out nicely. Just saw Gasly a few moments ago as well on a, on a, a real fast lap for the RP, but then bailed out of it in the middle sector, having to weave his way through the traffic. Uh, just getting another look at uh, Fernando Alonso making his way through to back into the swimming pool. She had Sainz wanted to, to have three minutes gap in Monaco. Getting a bit fed up of being stuck behind Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari. He wasn't uh, going to get out of the way of Alonso. And when we do get to qualifying, particularly in Q1, when there's all 20 cars on track, traffic is going to be a massive challenge. Getting yourself that gap that you need, the space, but without having, without backing up on the circuit, which you're not allowed to do within the regulations. So there's going to be a huge amount of traffic chaos in the first part of qualifying tomorrow afternoon. 24 minutes and 43, 42 41 seconds. Leclerc currently fastest. Alonso, Verstappen, Norris, signs the top five. Jenny Gap. Yes, and Dash down here at Red Bull and having a look at Max Verstappen's car. They've done quite a bit of work to the front wing where he's obviously had this touch with the wall. They put some tape along um, and tried to strengthen that front wing, but it's worth noting that is uh, uh, it's not running at its optimum, and they're going to have to run that for the rest of this um, this session. So. Yeah, I don't think this is the Friday that he would want. And after the Friday last time out at Imola, where it didn't go quite to plan, they didn't run that hard tyre, and I think it might have... I mean, he still won, but it, that led to the challenge from Norris. And uh, they just wanted a nice, regular Monaco Friday, and they've not quite got what they wanted, I'm afraid. No, as Hamilton comes across the line at second fastest for the British driver, two tenths behind Charles Leclerc. So it's Leclerc, Hamilton, Alonso, Verstappen, Norris, the top five. Then comes Sainz in sixth, just hearing Lando Norris locking up at the Nouvelle Chicane and running straight over it, the front right smoking from the lockup in a uh, slightly new livery for the McLaren drivers, a uh, tribute to Ayrton Senna. Of course, this year, remembering 30 years since Senna's sad passing, the McLaren team running. Senna's iconic green, yellow and blue colours, both on the actual car, but also on the overalls and all the team kit as well. It's a fabulous colour. Yeah, about 20 minutes left of a free practice too. We've seen some fast-paced qualifying simulation runs. And at the moment, it is early stages, but Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari is looking rapid. At the moment, he's fastest ahead of Lewis Hamilton. What about the two Red Bulls? Well, we haven't quite seen everything yet from Max Verstappen or Sergio Perez. But on the face of it right now, it looks like Red Bull have a challenge this weekend. The Ferraris are quick, even the Mercedes and McLaren too, all up there. Just a little uh, Five Life Sports Bulletin update for you. Sorry for uh, going silent there for a moment. Um, what is interesting, though, is some of the gaps between teammates that are developing, uh, Mark, betwi particularly between Leclerc and Sainz. Leclerc's best lap so far this session, a 1.11.6. Sainz's best lap, a 1.11.9. That is a big gap. Yeah, it is. And, and actually, you often get it here at a more typical circuit quite often where there's a, a little bit of space more runoff you know you're able to take a few more risks you eventually find the limit of the car from both drivers so you find the drivers pretty close here you don't get that luxury to to push to to you find the limits it's down to the driver in in such a, a big way so you will find that one driver may well just get a little bit more out or have a little bit more confidence you know be able to push that a little bit further and that's where some of these big gaps are coming from uh jenny yeah, I just wanted to ask Mark, a, a mistake like Max Verstappen's made and that little tiny bit of damage that he's picked up, um, how much could that cost him when they're going out there and doing those fast runs? It's a lot. You know, for everything we've been saying about getting that confidence in the driver and, and getting the driver confident in his car, it comes from just being on track and pounding round and round and round. You quite often see in, a, in a practice sessions at other tracks where you'll get low fuel runs, you know, the fuel... The car will be fueled for just an outlap and then a flyer and then back in again. You actually rarely do that here because there's more value to be had from just getting the driver to do more and more laps, staying on circuit as much as possible and, uh, and pounding round because that's where they're able to, to feel where the grip is. It's where they're able to just nudge the car that tiny bit closer each lap to the walls and 
And uh, so having a little bit of damage and a disruption like that can be costly for, for you and your team. Yeah, well, 20 minutes left of this session. Talking about gaps between teammates, Leclerc and Sainz, fairly sizable. Even Norris and Piastri, actually, there is a gap starting to develop. The Oscars, uh, Oscar Piastri's fastest lap one. 12.3, Lando Norris a 1.11.9, a so a few tenths of a second. Is that a medium tyre for Piastri, soft? Ah, um, okay. but even so, I think uh, even when they were on the same tyre, I still think Norris was quite some way quicker. Uh, the same with uh, Perez versus Verstappen as well. Verstappen fourth, Perez down eight tenths now, off, uh, off Leclerc's time at least, in eighth at the moment. Uh, Albon, Russell round out the top ten. In the lower half, it's Sonoda. Then Piastri, Magnussen, Hulkenberg, Ricardo, 15th. Gasly, with a lot more running done this session after a power unit issue at FP1, 16th fastest in front of Logan Sargent. Then comes Esteban Ocon and the two Saubers not having the best time of it at the moment. They are down in 19th and 20th. This is the sound of Daniel Ricardo up through the gears and across the line, 15th fastest on the medium tyre. I think the, uh, the graphics operator who produces the F1 uh, TV graphics that we're watching here has just got this graphic that says, I've hit the wall, and he's just playing it out and out, over and over from different drivers, because they're all doing it. And it's not uncommon. That's not actually unusual, as I said, around here. It just depends on the severity of that hit. Um, I just want to say, actually, looking at Lewis Hamilton, who sits in second, he's now only a tenth behind Charles Leclerc on the same tyre, on the soft tyre. So... That's genuine pace from Lewis Hamilton. This is something that we haven't seen at other circuits. And as we talked about, quite often the driver can really make a big difference. Lewis is vastly experienced. He's won multiple times around here. He knows this circuit and he loves it. And it's a chance for the drivers to really show what they can do. I think the drivers really kind of come into this weekend thinking, this is a chance for me to really express myself and show what I can do from a driving perspective and, and at the moment Lewis really putting himself in a, a really good place. Yeah we were hearing from Lewis Hamilton yesterday and he was saying how much he loves the circuit how he came here as a young boy and dreamed of moving to here living here and then driving here and he's made all of that come true and he's won three times around here in um, 8, 16 and 19 and I think he's just desperate to win again. He's looked at other people who've seen Norris excel in that McLaren and he's like, I want a bit of that. And I think realistically, this this is a place he could do it. Sorry, What's Jenny. That? <laughs> Sorry, that Jenny. <laughs> I slipped into, I've slipped into the demo. just watching Verstappen coming through Sam Devore, the rear end stepping out. And it, well, if that wasn't contact with the wall, it was mightily close. Uh, apologies, Jenny, carry on. <laughs> No, it's fine. I was just saying, um, uh, Hamilton finds this place as thrilling as your commentary, Harry. He, he didn't. He? he spoke about it as a roller coaster, and that even now he still gets that buzz back when he goes out on track. Yeah, it was. Speaking in his press conference that he does in front of the media uh, yesterday, it was really nice to hear Lewis Hamilton talking about McLaren. It, it really felt genuine what what he said. How it warms his heart to see where McLaren are and, and how much they've climbed over the last few years because they were on a bit of a trajectory but then the new regulations came in and they and they and they made a step back yeah but he's got a, he's got a soft spot for for McLaren you know it's where he, he started his career it's what he, the people that gave him that chance and and you know and I feel the same I was there when Lewis you know came into this sport I was there when he won around here in 08 and went on to take that championship and, you know, they are a great organisation that have been struggling for quite a long time and have now started this rebuilding process and everything's just now starting to fall into place and, and we're just seeing the beginnings of those results of that. So it is nice to see. I think they're a team that are kind of universally liked, a little bit like Williams up and down the pit lane. People just want to see them do well and it's starting to happen. It certainly is. Uh, just getting a look at a replay of Lance Stroll making his way through the swimming pool and as he turns into the right hander in the second part of the chicane he hits the wall he manages to carry on going the right the front right that was the sound of it clouting that inside barrier it wasn't exactly flat on but it looks like he lives to fight another day on that well i don't know it was a big enough hit i mean it, there's no the obvious damage rods don't seem no. on, on the face of it at least bent out of sorts too much but it's the one that, you know, people at home will be familiar with if you've seen this on television before. It's where they clip the barrier on the way into that chicane 
the front right suspension can often fail and that then just spits you straight off in the outs into the outside barrier and that's your, your race or your session over. But so far, he continues and he'll find his way back to the pits. Uh, 15 minutes and 33. 32, 31 seconds remain of free practice. Two and the two Mercedes drivers. Lewis Hamilton in second. George Russell down in 10th. I believe both are currently in the pits, which is where we can find Jenny Gap. Yeah, they are in the pits and uh, they're just doing a front wing adjustment to um, George Russell's car. And actually, they're just looking at how how the um, structure of the front wing is. I think he's had a, a quite a significant brush with the wall. Looking at the latterings around the Pirelli tyre anyway, it looks like he's rubbed them off. And they're just testing, is that wing okay? Has it taken a significant hit? But I think it looks like it's all okay at the minute. I'm just getting moved out of the way, so they're uh, getting ready to... Oh, they're just having a look under the front wing, actually, to check and see that there's no actual damage under there as well. So he must have had a bit of a whack over the kerb, I'm, I'm expecting. Well, wouldn't be too surprised. Esteban Ocon coming to the line out there on the soft tyre in his Alpine. Of course, a man who finished on the podium here last year with a fantastic drive to third. He just comes across the line and it's 14th for the Frenchman. And, and what a year it's been. Uh, what a change for Alpine and, and Ocon's hopes from, from the highs of a podium in Monaco yeah. to, to struggling to, to get through to Q2 regularly in, in qualifying. Yeah, that's right. They've had big investment, haven't they? Celebrity investment, even in that team. So you know, they were sort of looking. They are looking to the future. They're looking in the in terms of the long term. Here, it's not just a, a sort of you know quick operation. This when they're looking to sell. We've already had conversation as Pierre Gasly, his teammate, has just made matters worse for Alpine, and he's put his into the wall. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of drivers that have hit the wall, but no one's had. Everyone's. I don't want to you know jinx it, but no one's had a massive shunt, have they? It's all. It's all been glances to the wall sometimes the, the sort of contact looks so innocuous and then the whole front suspension falls apart doesn't it and it really is all about just exactly how that loading that shot loading is put into the uh, the suspension components and that's about the angle of course and the speed and the severity of how you how you hit it but um yeah, we've seen a few people get away with it you know this is how you find those limits on a regular racetrack you might step over the four li the lines with your four tires and you have a lap time deleted that's how you find your limit on a more traditional circuit here you find your limits by just kissing that ball well heading back out onto the track then in these last 13 minutes the glares out there so too is hamilton alonso as well this is the sound as we ride on board with Alex Albon downhill braking into the Nouvelle chicane so tight to the wall as they chuck it in left then it's a quick right hander as they peel their way down the short burst towards an almost flat out to back they do have to take lead off the throttle in practice and then out through the swing pull chicane we almost find ourselves into Raskas, the right-hander, pit lane entry to your right. Albon carries on going uphill, braking now through Anthony Noves. Tricky off camber braking as well. Yeah. Slings it into the right-hander. Then the DRS line comes down the main straight. Uh, it's not an improvement on time. Albon is currently ninth fastest, though. Uh, nine tenths off Leclerc's fastest lap time on the soft tyre. The, the swimming pool section here in Monaco is a wonderful section of racetrack to see these cars come through. I mean, there's no hope of anybody overtaking really through there, but just to watch them, particularly on a Saturday in qualifying, where they change direction so quickly, they clip curves on both sides of the racetrack and just thread their way through the barrier, and it's massively high speed. It's, a, it's an amazing sight, you know, for those who are any, anyone lucky enough to ever find their way down here to, to watch these cars go through there, it's incredible. But even if you see it on television, and even if you can't do that, to hear us talk about it and describe it here on the radio, it's an amazing thing to behold, particularly with a modern Formula One car. Um, wonderful section. Uh, yellow flag out at the moment. Not sure who it's for, but it's come back in, so I imagine somebody's... Uh, perhaps had a little excursion and managed to find themselves back onto the track. I'm sure we'll figure out who that is. Hamilton, though, to the line on the medium tyre, uh, now looking at more of the long run pace and uh, at a glimpse into what Sunday's race pace might tell us happening now in these closing stages of FP2. Yeah, and, and talking about Sunday and, and race pace, and it was Charles Leclerc who had that little tiny excursion, but managed to uh, avoid hitting anything, do a little pirouette and get his way back on at the first corner. Um, Sunday, 
they're looking at race pace now. They're looking at uh, you know how you prepare your car for the longevity of a race. It's probably going to be a one-stop race. That's what it normally is around here, unless we get rain. But the timing of that pit stop is crucial. And one of the major factors that has to go into your strategic decisions ahead of Sunday is giving yourself the option of running as long as possible because the chance of something like a safety car or yellow flags and red flags, virtual safety cars, is so high, you don't want to get caught out. So your penalty for, for carrying extra fuel around is, is limited around here because it's not an all-out, flat-out circuit. So you really want to be looking at how far you can really take these tyres and your fuel load into that race before you have to be, you know, before you're forced into making a pit stop just so that you've got yourself covered for any eventuality certainly is 10 minutes or so left of this free practice two session to uh, end the day's running for uh, friday we will have another fp3 session tomorrow this is before we go qualifying uh, and aston martin fernando alonso third fastest at the moment lance stroll just come back into the pits at seventh fastest uh, off the back of scoring points in imola as well jenny his first points uh, scoring since australia yeah, I think that'll be a relief to him, but unfortunately, he's just hopped out the car. So after that brush, well, it was a bit more than a brush, wasn't it? Heavy petting with the barrier. Um, Lance Stroll's session might be over, unfortunately. They were looking at the car. They took the front wing off, and I think that's the end of his running, which will be, that'll be a shame for him because, as you say, he, he scored points. He was looking fairly good, but now as he takes his balaclava off and his... Um, earpieces as well, I think, yeah, that, that might be a day, I think, for Stroll. An early bath then for uh, Stroll, an early visit to, uh, I'm sure, one of the yachts in the harbour, which... <laughs> which <laughs> Don't feel too sorry for me. <laughs> um, SJ on hashtag BBCF1 has asked me to do a sync up, because every time I do one, he misses it. So here it is for you. I hope, you, I hope you're getting this one. There's eight minutes and 44, 43, 42 seconds remain of three practice two and if you're lucky i might do one more before the end of the session but we have only got eight and a half minutes left so it's leclerc fastest these were all set on the soft tire earlier on when we were getting into the quali simulation runs just under two tenths back is lewis hamilton then alonso verstappen norris the top five signs stroll perez albon russell completes the top 10 just outside it sonoda ahead of piastri then it's magnuson in 13th Ocon, Hulkenberg, Ricardo, Gasly, Sargent, 18th, and the two Saubers. A little bit of drift. Bottas, and then quite a bit of drift off his teammate, is Joe Guan Yu, 20th at last. I wonder if his confidence has been knocked slightly from his uh, rather big hit in FP1, but also he's a man under pressure for that seat. In fact, we expect both Bottas and Joe to be out of that seat, uh, out of the Sauber team come the end of the year. We know it's transforming into Audi for to, uh, for uh, next season and uh, and Nico Hulkenberg has been confirmed already so one of them's got to go but we're hearing both are off yeah it's not ever a nice situation for a driver to be in and we talked earlier about how there is still movement that's still to play out and that can be really exciting for some drivers but for those two with your position potentially under threat where the, the decisions may not be yours about the future of where you end up driving that can be a really destabilizing thing i think drivers and it'll be the same for Perez further up the grid. He wants to get a decision made as soon as possible. You know, whatever that decision ends up being, he wants to know because driving when you, you have an unknown future, I think can be really destabilizing. So everybody looking now and trying to get their futures locked in wherever that may be. But some, perhaps those Sauber drivers, um, could be on the end of somebody else's whim rather than their own. Do you think Valtteri Bottas still has something to offer to a Formula One team? Ten-time Grand Prix winner, 67 podiums, was fairly close to Lewis Hamilton and on occasion could beat him when they were teammates. Well, he's got that. He's got experience, hasn't he? And he's got experience with a top team as well from Mercedes. That all counts for something because it's, uh, it's often about how the team works, things like operations and procedures, and all of that can be valuable to a, a team further down the grid. But we've also seen that there are some really sort of young guns that are, are good and are able to deliver under the pressure that Formula One brings now. So you don't necessarily value experience in the same way that you used to, where no one would ever touch a youngster. Lewis Hamilton, I remember coming in as a, as a rookie in a top team at McLaren. That was so unheard of back then. Obviously, it worked out quite well. 
But, you know, it was an unusual thing. Nowadays, I think the top team's a little bit less scared of putting a, a youngster in the top seats. It's fascinating the change, though, isn't it? Because we, we had an influx of young drivers. Well, first we had sort of Verstappen and Sainz being brought in at Toro Rosso, but they were always bringing in new drivers fairly regularly. But yeah. then you had 2019. Your Albons, your Leclerc's, well, further back Leclerc, but you also had your George Russells. Yeah. Hamilton on the radio. So matching Piastri and Norris in the opening laps, but uh, Piastri got down to 14.8. So Hamilton just uh, being given some data to uh, help him on his way. What he's, on a talking long run about, now. he's talking about race pace now. We're not talking about outright lap time. That's the, the engineers looking at the, the race pace of the competitors um, that are around him. And he's being told there that, you know, his, his race pace, which was matching McLaren earlier on, is now just starting to fall shy of what McLaren are able to do. That's interesting, an in interesting insight for us looking ahead to Sunday. Five minutes remaining, Hamilton to the line, and uh, well, 5.2 seconds off, but we are doing that long run pace, which we can get a little insight on. Andrew Benson, I feel like we're being robbed, though, because we don't have we don't have the music. What? We don't have it. So I'm just going to have to throw it to you. Andrew, well, what I'm not going to sing it, Harry. Anyone so <laughs> <laughs> can imagine the Eagles song that uh, the producers seem to love so much before this, then uh, they're welcome to. But I'm just going to go straight into it. So um, we saw earlier that Charles Leclerc and the Ferrari were looking really impressive on the short qualifying type runs. The same is true. Uh, here's some radio. Just keep an eye on the uh, steering talk. Something feels weird in the straight line. Uh, yeah, copy that. So that's George Russell not happy with the way the steering feels. Anyway, to go back to the uh, long run pace, Charles Leclerc on the medium tyre is a second a lap on average faster than Sergio Perez in the Red Bull on the same tyre. Uh, that's only a couple of laps of data there in terms of that set, but it's still impressive. And he's also about half a second quicker than Carlos Sainz, his teammate. Uh, Leclerc, that is. And, um, so, and we've already heard from Mercedes uh, how the McLaren and the Mercedes compare. They were obviously pretty clear that the McLaren ends up quicker than their car. Uh, unfortunately for us, for a comparison with Max Verstappen, which is the one we really care about, um, he's on the hard tyre. So um, he's lapping at around about the same pace as Leclerc, um, although there's lots of traffic laps uh, interrupting the, uh, the, the averages, which is a bit complicated around Monaco always. Um, but of course, that's, so that's encouraging for him on the hard tyre. Um, and I tell you what, though, you would normally expect, Mark, wouldn't you, for, the, uh, for them to start on the soft in Monaco and then go on to the medium, probably. But it's interesting that they've all chosen to do their first stint race time on the medium tyre, which yeah. suggests that's going to be the preferred start tyre. It is interesting. And, and partly the reason for that is that, you, like I said earlier, you kind of want to give yourself the option of being able to run long in case that almost inevitable safety car comes late in the race. You don't want to have already made your pit stop and miss out on the cheap stop. Um, but also interesting, I think, when looking at Verstappen, there was a comment for, which I thought was interesting from Helmut Marco, and, and I normally take those with a slight pinch of salt, but he was talking about how at Red Bull they often find, or at the moment they're finding, that they find the car very quick on one tyre but not on the other, whereas the likes of Ferrari and McLaren in recent races have been quick on both. And... You know, that was something that we saw kind of play out in, uh, in, the, in the last race in Imola, which brought that challenge towards the end of the race with um, Lando Norris, you know, finding a lot more pace towards the end of that Grand Prix. So it may well be that we're seeing the same thing here from Verstappen, that one tyre will work really well for them, but another maybe not quite so much. They're not able to dial both in and, uh, and are sort of targeting one. Well, just uh, a few minutes left. Apparently, on my last sync up, that didn't match up either. So you get one more, <laughs> one minute and 54, 53, 52 seconds. If that, that hasn't done it, then I, I might mean, have to give up on If you're only syncing up now, you've, I know, you're a bit but late. It's but... uh, hashtag BBCF1 demands, hashtag BBCF1 gets. <laughs> Jenny Gow. Oh, I like that. Um, do I? Uh, can I make demands and get them as well? Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, What's the that demand? That sounds like a no, isn't it? I, I can't think of one at the moment. I'll find one. Um, just on the Red Bull at the minute, we heard uh, so much of their work overnight in Imola on Friday night was down to Sebastian Bomi spending 11 hours in the sim just going lap after lap after lap to hone in their setup. Now, this weekend, they do not have Sebastian Buemi because he's at Formula E. They do not have Jake Dennis, their other sim driver, because he is 
at Formula E. So I believe it's Liam Lawson who is in the sim this weekend and will be up all night going round and round a Monaco circuit in a sim. But it's interesting that they don't have that safety net this weekend. The car is just eating the tyres in turn three and four. Front left especially in four. The Alex album then is struggling out there on tyres. Uh, coming through, that's Massonet through Casino Square. Where is the Williams driver at the moment? He's ninth fastest on that soft tyre run. Ended up nine tenths off of Charles Leclerc. Teammate Logan Sargent, 1.5 seconds down in 18th spot. So uh, Williams then not too happy with the way they're treating their tyres. Uh, I'll tell you what, Sebastian Buemi, two tenth place finishes around here in Monaco. So good start. A mate, point each start. time. Uh, do you know what's interesting actually that, that Jenny just touched on there? People at home may not actually be aware of this. All of the teams do this, of course, but. What you see here at the racetrack is a tiny part of what makes up a Formula One team. There are a huge number of engineers plus drivers that are running around in the simulator calculating from all the data that's being collected the best ways to adapt their car or to adapt driving styles. And a lot of that work happens well away from this racetrack, not even in the same country on many occasions, but it's crucial and critical to the outcomes as we saw at Red Bull last time out. So got to give a lot of respects and maybe a little shout out for all the members of all of these teams up and down the pit lane that are not even here don't even get to come to this glamorous place but are doing a lot of that really hard work in the background absolutely well then checkered flag is out free practice two is done and dusted we've got a glimpse into what qualifying might bring us we've got a glimpse into where these teams might stack up when it comes to race pace but at the end of fp2 Fastest lap times done on the soft compound tyre. Charles Leclerc fastest, a 1.11.278. A tenth and a half clear of Lewis Hamilton. Then comes Alonso, Verstappen, Norris, the top five. Sainz, Stroll, Perez, Albon, Russell, the top ten. Then it's Sonoda just on the outskirts at 11th in front of Piastri. Then Magnussen, Ocon, Hulkenberg, Ricardo is 16th fastest ahead of Pierre Gasly with more running done today uh, in this session for the Alpine man after PU units, uh, PU issues in free practice one. Sergeant 18th and the two Saubers struggling for pace. Bottas ahead of Joe Guanyu who makes up the 20 drivers, Jenny. Yeah, so it's the local home hero who is fastest at FP2, Charles Leclerc in that Ferrari. I feel excited. This could go any way, couldn't it, guys? It really could. Yeah, I think it is exciting, genuinely. I'm really excited to see Lewis up there because I think that's genuine pace. He's genuinely making a difference with that car. A long way ahead of his teammate who's not happy. But Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, Fernando Alonso in third. That's great to see. And we, we definitely haven't seen the best of Max Verstappen yet. The two McLarens have still got to show their hand, really. So it's all to play for, and I love it. I think it's, it's so fascinating around here because you can see the cars improve. Every lap they go out there, they find something else. And as you say, the driver in this situation makes such a massive difference. And Charles Leclerc, I don't know, Andrew Benson, what is it about him that he just goes well around here? Is it, is it the Silverstone factor for Hamilton? Is it just that it's his home race? Well, one of the things I think, Jenny, is that he's very comfortable with the car feeling alive with oversteer. And um, one of the, and what you need around Monaco is a sharp front end. Of course, the problem with a sharp front end is it means that the rear end can dance around a lot. Not all drivers are comfortable with that. Leclerc is, and that means he can balance that car with the perfect turn in while still being able to slide it within millimeters of the barriers but not risk hitting them. So it's, it's that... It's that uh, acrobatic ability if you like that uh, makes him so such a force around Monaco I think that's what it is that we love about Monaco isn't it it's a true test of the driver a lot of the time it's you know the car makes up 75% the driver makes up the extra 25% but here it feels marked like that difference is is gone the car advantage isn't as important as pure driver advantage yeah it's a hundred percent true you know it's a bit of a leveler in terms of some of the nuances with these cars we have got you know the top three teams now very very close but you'd say the mercedes wouldn't be part of that real top gang at the moment and yet here we are with lewis really a genuine contender so that just shows you what kind of a difference it can make it's all about confidence and lewis is full of it right now and what about the weather? I'm having a look at my app. At all of the teams will be looking at their data and information for tomorrow. We were expecting rain coming into this for qualifying. 
Is that still lingering about and how much could that affect what's going on out there? I think we are looking at potentially a little bit of rain tomorrow, but because of where we are, right on the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea, sort of tucked in, in the hills that surround Monaco, any rain could very quickly be blown away. But we've had a few spits on and off today. It was quite a lot of rain yesterday. If there's going to be any rain, it looks like it's mainly going to come on qualifying day, not for race day. Yeah, I mean, we had rain, we had thunder, we had lightning. It's, it felt like we had four seasons in one day yesterday. Um, so it, it makes it for an interesting Saturday. Make sure you join us. The final practice session is at 11.30 UK time. That's an hour. And then qualifying gets underway at 3 o'clock UK time. That will be on the uh, BBC Sport website. The final practice will be on Extra but you can hear it all on the BBC Sport website anyway. And uh, we will bring coverage of all the reactions to first Friday of Monaco on the BBC Sport website itself with Andrew Benson furiously typing away. My thanks to you, Harry, to Andrew, to Mark, and uh, we will be back tomorrow morning. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.